Thank you everyone for joining me today. And I'm blessed to have as my guest, Richard Windeman. He is the co-founder and president of Survivors of Childhood Sex Abuse. That's C, excuse me, S-C-S-A. And I will put um, information, more information about Richard and that organization in the video description right here. Thank you, Richard, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Oh, no. God bless you. Thank you. Um, I thought about this a lot. I'm always conflicted about asking survivors to recount their stories because, I mean, I've, I've done it many times. I've, I've had to retell it many times. Um, especially, I mean, I know a little bit about this, but even you know, in, in, it reminds me of in legal proceedings, um, survivors have to recount their story over and over again. And then, Person. yeah, and then when you try to give testimony uh, about it, just in a, in a more informal setting, like here, you have to repeat it over and over again. And it, sometimes it feels like you're still trying to prove that it actually happened. So, um, I mean, I'm sensitive to that. So, and, and much of what your story is about and much of what happened to you, I'll include in uh, the video description because there was a very well done profile um, produced about your case. Mm -hmm. I think it was on a local New Orleans uh, television station. So people can watch that there, but I will let you um, share anything about your story that you, that you want. Okay, so I'll go into as much detail as you want to. You know, I'm far along in my healing process, so I don't get triggered. I do a lot of media, so I'm totally comfortable. It's up to you. I don't, when I usually tell my story in oh. about five minutes with very little detail, but I, again, I leave it up to you. Um, I mean, part of the things that I've done in, in um, my therapy with my psychologist and, and psychiatrist is um, exposure therapy. I mean, some people are at different places on that journey. I'm, I would say, I mean, I don't know you very well, but from what I've read and what I've heard, I think you're further along than me. Um, so I hope some people who are survivors might find this video helpful and healing just to hear about what you're right, what, what, what you've experienced. So my experience in terms of healing, and like you said, we're all individual, um, but I think we can all agree that you have to take a uh, holistic approach to healing. And mm -hmm. so what worked for me is Lexapro and Abilify as medicine from, you know, my psychiatrist. Well, uh, what, are, what are those, Richard, just for people that don't know? It's a, um, well, um, Lexapro is an antidepressant and Abilify is a mood stabilizer. Then after that, you have to get a trauma-informed psychologist. So what worked for me is ego state therapy as a primer and an adjunct to EMDR therapy. And then the third component is fellowship with other survivors. And that's, that's a lot, not everything, but that's all, you know what we primarily do at SESA. We have support group, our peer-led support group meetings every single week. Uh, could you just tell people again what EMDR is? I forgot the acronym, but basically it's binaural stimulation. So uh, it can be visual, it can be tactile, and you can just do audio as well. Yeah, yes. I, it's, it's funny because I've done that as well. Um, I, I think you're, you're really correct. I think um, there's a propensity sometimes a long time I, I think less so now. Um, I mean, I've been in and out of um, therapy probably most of my life. And um, I've been on SSRIs, which is, I think, different from what you're on. No, but, that's a, it's a sorry. Is it? Oh, okay, sorry. And um, I think you're right with saying holistic. I don't know. Some people might not understand what that means. But um, I've been, I've been just on medication at times and not had any therapy, mm -hmm. which is really the wrong way to go. I mean, personally, from my point of view. 
Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's where you're coming from, too. Yeah, and my definition of holistic is that you have to take a varied approach to healing, you know, whatever vector helps you. You know, you have a lot of options out there. Yes, yes. I've, I've been on, I think, most of the SSRIs. I've been, right now I'm on Luvox. I've been on Paxil. I've been on um, uh, Zoloft, Prozac. <laughs> Yeah, it took a while to find the right SSRI for me. Yeah, it do, it does. It's mental well being is difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a lot of trial and error. I would mm -hmm. like to. I, I mean, we're taking a deep dive right away. Um, it takes a lot of trial and error, and I think it also takes finding the right uh, mental health professional that's that's not easy to do yeah I would, it, I would love to talk to you about that yeah so it took it took me a long time too um to find the right person and you know one of one of my uh, sayings is is that telling the next damn shrink the same damn thing and uh, yeah and so um i found a lady uh, who is trauma-informed, trained in childhood sex abuse. Um, she's a psychologist, not a therapist. And, and she was uh, one of the developers of EMDR. And so thank God she's local to me. And so, yeah, I, I see her once a week. Wow. I, I laughed quietly when you said that about, you know, having to recount your damn story again, because I've done that. And it's very difficult you know, when you've been with a therapist for a while and they know your story and then for whatever reason you have to go to somebody else, it is, it's like, um, I, I mean, it's like reliving it again. It's, it's pretty awful. And um, yeah, for me, it's been difficult. And I, and I want to focus our time on male survivors. There's a lot of women survivors out there of, of, of pre-sex abuse and childhood sexual assault. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we're both, we're both men. Yeah. And um, I think there's a, there's a vacuum there. There's not a lot of space. I mean, you're providing that now with what you're doing, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of space for men to share their stories. Um, I, I wanted to throw this, I, I like to do research before I talk to my guests and I knew some of these stats, but they're always surprising again. This is um, a little study I looked at, suicide risk factors between childhood sexual abuse and suicide ideation among male and female suicide attempters. 32%, almost 33% of those who tried to commit suicide or had suicidal ideation, which means you're thinking about killing yourself, uh, experienced CSA, which is childhood sexual assault. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah although women are more likely to report uh, a history of childhood sexual assault, report doesn't mean necessarily that they reported it to legal authorities, but just that they, they shared it with someone. Yeah, just um, yeah, you don't have to go public to uh, come forward. You can tell tell someone. Right. Yeah. So men reporting childhood sexual assault experienced more hopelessness and suicide ideation mm -hmm. and were more likely to have attempted suicide attempts multiple times and to be diagnosed with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what I have, and BPD, which is bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. in comparison to men without a history of childhood sexual assault. So a lot of people don't realize that um, not everybody that's mentally ill or not everybody that's attempted suicide has been sexually assaulted, but a large number has. So it's been my experience that just almost without exception, uh, childhood sex abuse victims, they suffer from clinical depression, anxiety disorder, PTSD, almost without exception. And some of them have dissociative disorder. And so what happens is, um, you know, the, the abuse happens and then you keep it a secret because it's embarrassing, humiliating. You live in a bubble of shame and guilt. 
Uh, and as a result, with all of those psychological um, comorbidities or, or co-occurring disorders, is that when you don't ask for help, these tend to self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. And when that doesn't work anymore, and it will stop working, then suicide. I, I can tell you a couple of stories about suicide of, of, of victims um, very, very close to me. One, for example, his name, his name was Nate Lindstrom, and he wasn't just a victim or survivor, but he was a warrior, and he was a child sex abuse uh, victim advocate. And, you know, as well as he was along in his healing, and he was along in his healing, just whatever happened, he committed suicide. And also, when my, pub, when my story went public, it turned out that um, one of my childhood friends was abused by the same man at Jesuit High School. His sister walked in on the abuse, stopped it, but she didn't say anything. Mm. And when my story went public, she committed suicide the next day. Dear Lord. Yeah. God rest her soul. Yes. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize, I think, that men and boys are the victims of sexual assault. Um, I, think, I think there's a conception or a, well, not a concept, a misconception that mm -hmm. men and boys can't be sexually assaulted, that it's part of, it's part of a, a growing up experience as opposed, as opposed to um, women and girls. Um, this, I think, especially, it's interesting talking to you because, I mean, I have talked to other male survivors, but they've all been um, gay men. And the, uh, like me, you know, I still identify with the LGBTQ um, mm -hmm. community. So it's, it's, it's interesting to talk to you as a heterosexual man because, I mean, the space that I was in, the gay male community, it was not at all unusual for my friends or people that I knew mm -hmm. to, re to recount experiences from their childhood mm -hmm. of having sex with adults. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I just want to throw another, this, this statistic, I think I, or this study, I think I, I recount in almost every podcast I do because I think it's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and like all scientific, uh, like the scientific method, it's been able to be repeated. Um, so it's real. This is comparative data of childhood and adolescent molestation and heterosexual and homosexual uh, men. Mm -hmm. For, 46 percent of homosexual men, in contrast to seven percent of heterosexual men, reported homosexual molestation. That's a lot. So almost half of of gay men were reported being molested as children. Right. And I, I found that to be true because I just remember it. And I mean, I was in that place too, mm -hmm. because I was molested. This is what drew me to your story again. I was molested twice, which is hard to admit because yeah. I think as a man, people will kind of think, well, what's wrong with you? Were you asking for it? Did you want it? You, yeah. you, were, you were assaulted twice, you know, by different people, you know, yeah. well, yeah. Um, and that's complicated. I want to talk about that with you too, why there's re-victimization among uh, survivors. But in the space I was in, I didn't even realize till I was much, much older that I had been molested. I mean, I was an eight-year-old boy and then I was a 16-year-old teenager and I had sex with adults and I, I didn't think I was molested. Well, that's interesting. Um, I can tell you that I read a, 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 a psychology paper out of Stanford University, and they suggest that there are 4 million uh, victims that haven't come forward yet. They're living a life of pure hell. And you're, you're right in saying that women are more, or first off, it's very embarrassing for any sex. But yeah, the women, so they, um, they come forward about their abuse in multiples above men. And I can tell you uh, as a straight man is um, when my abuse finally stopped, 
uh, I had, uh, I always knew I was heterosexual, you know, I knew who I was attracted to. And so to prove to myself that I wasn't gay, I went into a, a promiscuity mm. section of my life where I had as much sex as I could um, with women. And so I did it in a real methodical way. Um, I would go down to the New Orleans Convention Center and find out the schedule. And then I would go to the hotel bar where the convention was being held. And, you know, Sarah from, say, Nebraska was in town. And um, it, um, we just met in the bar. Uh, she's one of many. And we would wind up going up to the hotel uh, room and have sex. Now, looking at it as an adult, we were both adults and it was consensual. But the problem with me was I realized that because my process was so uh, procedural and, um, and methodical, it occurred to me that I was using the same grooming techniques that I had learned from the pedophiles. Wow. Sex. Yeah. And when I realized that I couldn't stand myself, I couldn't look in the mirror, and I actually attempted suicide at 19 years old. And um, it was nothing short of a miracle that I survived. I, it wasn't a cry for help. I intended to die. And um, I, I knew that I, that I was committing suicide. My mom was sleeping in the bed. I took a whole bottle of her Cinequan, which is an antidepressant, and a sedative. I took the whole bottle, and there was an oak tree on Napoleon Avenue in the Wallings where I wanted to die. I picked where I was going to die. So I took the pills, walked out around the block to go to my oak tree, and a policeman on a horse approached me. And he said, stop. Now, I was a street smart kid at that point. I knew that all I had to do is just start jumping fences, and he'd never see me again. But for the first time in my life, I complied, and I stayed still. An ambulance pulled, pulled up about five or ten minutes later, and they didn't know that I was trying to commit suicide, but they followed that protocol. Nobody knew that I was trying to commit suicide. And so they put me in the back of the ambulance, and they started giving me this syrup to make me throw up. The policeman got off um, the horse and went into the back of the ambulance and he put his hand on my chest and said, it's gonna be okay, just relax. And what's remarkable about that is number one, nobody knew that I was trying to commit suicide. Number two, this cop on a horse. In New Orleans, you never see a, a policeman on a horse uh, patrolling neighborhoods. They only use them in the French Quarter for crowd control during Mardi Gras. That's it. So that was weird. Uh, also, in New Orleans, if, if you're having chest pains and having a heart attack, the ambulance will get there in about 45 minutes to an hour. So all of these things happened in rapid succession. And I passed out uh, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And I woke up five days later uh, from a coma. Whoa. And uh, uh, I, you're restrained in the bed. You have, a, you have a ventilator and you're helping you to breathe. You have a catheter on. There's charcoal all over your body. And when you wake up like that, you panic. You're like, ah, I can't breathe, like that. And a nurse came by and she put something in my IV and it put me back to sleep. And then when I woke up again, about six hours later, I was unrestrained, the tube was out, the catheter was out. Uh, so I, I count the whole experience as a miracle in my life. Amen. And, and, I, and after that, my life got incredibly better, exponentially better after that experience. And you were 19 at that point, right? 19. Oh. That's good. It took me another 10 years of hell. Um, there's a lot there that you said that was really important. I, I kind of want to go step by step. Um, for, first, if I, can keep, if I can keep it straight in my brain. First of all, I, it's fascinating about what you talked about of becoming promiscuous. I mean, I, I definitely went through that. 
I've, I've kind of been through my life, I've kind of been all over on the spectrum, the attraction <laughs> spectrum. And I, I did go through a, a, bis, a period of bisexuality. And after my molestations, I did, I did have relationships with a lot of women, sexual relationships with a lot of women trying to figure out because I didn't want to be gay. I, unlike you, I didn't know. I, I had a lot of, of feelings t- towards men. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think what you described there too is important too. And I, I want to know what you think about this. Because I think a lot of times sur- survivors who are untreated, I think tend to try to recreate the past abuse. Now you talked about that in terms of mimicking the uh, the grooming methodology that was used on you, yeah. and I felt a lot of times when, especially not when I was involved with with women, but when I got involved with men, this mm-hmm. is all twenty twenty hindsight. Is yeah. it I was often attracted to men who were like my abusers, and to mm-hmm. situations that were my abusers, and I kind of wonder with you with your situation. Because I think a lot of times that's a way, because the mind is complicated. And I think that's a, a, a way for the mind to self-heal, that by recreating it, you feel like it wasn't so bad. It's you're redoing it with other people. And you're in an environment a lot of times where people are grooming each other, you know, using each other sexually, maybe abusing people. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a way to normalize it in your head that the abuse wasn't really abuse. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's called um, in recent times, that's called tra- uh, drama, not trauma, drama therapy. And so I watched the movie and it was so intense. I couldn't even get through it. But in the movie, they took survivors. Somehow they got access to a church and uh, they make the victims or survivors dress up as priests. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. That's... And, and reenact a mass. And I just, I couldn't take it. It was, it was awful. Yeah. That's, you know, what's part of this, well, none of my story I'm proud of, uh, none of it I'm, that I'm proud of, but I also, as an adult, became sexually involved with the Catholic priest. Mm-hmm. Again. And, and I would say it was a consensual relationship, although he, I was a vulnerable adult at that point. Mm-hmm. And he used the same methodology on me that, that was used. So it's, I, I want to go through these, these, these I, I wrote a list of, of things that men in particular experience as survivors when they're untreated. Um, so anger and rage. I, I still have that to this day. I'm curious about, you seem like no. <laughs> from what I've heard from your interviews, you're very well thought out. You're very cool. You seem um, very at a good place. Um, I'm trying to get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been doing media for about five, six years now, so I'm very comfortable doing it. But what was the original question? Um, I mean, anger and rage. Is that something that you still mm-hmm. grapple? Is it something you grapple with? Uh, I used to. And so, you know, um, earlier in my life, it was guilt and shame. And yes. then, then you come forward, go public. And then that's when I started to feel the anger and the rage. Richard, you are still, I don't want to put words in your mouth. This is what I've assumed from, from watching some of your interviews. You are still a Catholic. I'm no longer a Roman Catholic. Yeah, in spite of what happened to me, um, you know, I was baptized, I was confirmed, um, I became a liturgist in the church, uh, I became a Eucharistic minister, fourth degree night of Columbus. Oh, God bless you. Wow. And, and so I do keep my faith. And the reason I do that as part of my healing is all throughout what was happening to me, um, I had faith. Faith was the one thing that they couldn't take from me. Faith, faith's not something that you get from a guy in a white collar. Faith is a gift from God. And that got me through a lot of it. A lot of it. Richard, here's the, here's the but. Um, I mean, I've, I've been, I haven't been as, I did, never wanted to be an advocate in any way for, 
pre-sex abuse survivors. I mean, it's part of my story, but I'm not comfortable. I'm just not comfortable with it, sharing it in, in the way that you did. Mm-hmm. And you have, thank God you have. Um, I, I focused more on the LGBT community, mm-hmm. but um, I, I, like you, I've been doing this for a long time. And I, in the beginning, I, I, I think I kind of had a lot of hope. I was kind of like Jimmy Stewart in um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I was kind of like, I have a story and um, I'm going to tell it. And I think maybe it's pride. Maybe it's just being totally naive. I kind of thought I will be able to be a force for good in the Catholic church. And as I've been doing this for so long, you hit a wall and there's no getting around it. There's no, there's just no way to get through that wall, that clerical wall, whatever it is, a physical wall. And um, I said, I can't do it anymore because it's, it's, it's causing me to become more and more angry because you see the disinterest and go ahead, go ahead. I, I couldn't do it anymore. It was literally driving me crazy. No, it's a, it was a challenge for me to go through it. Um, I often get accused because I do a lot of advocacy work and exposure. I've been accused of trying to destroy the church, but you know it was the initial acts of abuse by the perpetrators that caused me to be like I was. And um, um, so I did it anyway. I kept my faith, um, and I can't speak a lot about the LBG, the LGBTQ community. Um, and that was a question I had for you. You know, how do you self-identify as a gay man and get the spiritual feeding that you need knowing that you're not welcome in a church? I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm sort of, like I said, I'm on the spectrum. I, I don't label myself as a gay, as a gay man. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very weird. The, the reason that I got, and I don't want to talk about too much about me, but, but um, I felt that there was a lot of misinformation in the Catholic Church mm-hmm. about homosexuality. I mean, I, 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 I'm a weird case. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm in San Francisco, and this is where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And I always grew up in a very gay affirmative atmosphere within the Catholic Church. Sure. Um, even as an adult. Um, I mean, I went to gay weddings officiated by Catholic priests. Really? Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So you? I, I mean, I never experienced that sort of homophobic that people talk about. I, I don't know where they experienced it, but I'm, I'm not going to discount their testimony, but or their recollections. But I never did, and I never have. It's mm-hmm. been the exact opposite. I've met priests who are very pro-gay to the point of um, coming on to you. Yeah. Oh yeah. What happens? <laughs> so one the, I've yeah. One of the challenges that I have is uh, all these movements piggy, try to piggy bank, <laughs> try to piggyback on on the survivor experience. So, for example, uh, the very very um, conservative arm of the church um, says that if you if you would allow um, priests uh, to marry. Um, that would fix the pedophilia problem. And that's absolutely incorrect because not all gay people are pedophiles. You know, you have straight people that are pedophiles. You have family members that are pedophiles, right? And so it isn't um, a gay issue. It is a pedophile issue. And what's the other analogy? Uh, um, No homosexuals in a church. That's something I hear all the time when I try to piggyback on our movement. No gays in, in the church as clerics or hierarchy. But, you know, not all gay people rape children. No. Right? So my brother, for example, he's a gay man. He's a business, a business owner. He, he pays taxes. Um, he's raising a wonderful young boy. But what my brother did as a homosexual, or what he didn't do, is he never raped a kid. Never. 
So not all gay people are bad people, oh, you know, and, 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 and getting rid of the celibacy rule is not going to fix the problem either, specifically pedophiles. I know I could, we could parse that out a bit. Um, I think it's not all pedophilia because pedophilia, as I understand it, is specifically pre-adolescent children. Yeah, and there's um, a for it. So there's, uh, yeah. there's pederast, there's hebophiles, but yes. I lump anybody who okay. is a pedophile. Okay, I see what you're going. The, you know, I have, want to be honest with you, Richard. Where I have felt, because you're more in this space than me, where I have felt alienated from other pre-sex abuse survivors is because there is that, I, I've heard that, that um, contention that, okay, the, the pre-sex abuse issue and the, um, the topic of gay priests or whatever, homosexual and priest are two separate things. But those two things were part of my story and they were a part of a lot of guys' stories that I know that, that my identity or whatever it was or perceived identity was part of the grooming process. It was specifically part of the process about the priest telling me that I was gay, confirming that I was gay, that God made me gay. And that's a lot of it. So yeah, go ahead. Well, from a, from a, a male victim's abuse, uh, abuse survivor, you know, if you're a young boy and you get raped by a man, uh, well, first off, that's homosexual um, encounter. So you have an example of a gay man who's also a pedophile, but you also have pedophiles um, that rape young girls too. So, and it's just like in any community, you have, um, you have, um, bad apples, you know, in any type of community, you know, it's one or two like policemen, not all policemen are bad, of course, only some of them break the law. And, um, God, if I got where I was going with this. <laughs> God bless you. But, uh, God bless you. This, bless you. <laughs> can, can I, wait, can I, I want to ask you another question that's directly um, related to this. Part of your, and I don't want to glom onto your story, and I don't want to read too much, and I don't want to attach anything about my story to your story. I hate when people do that to me. But one of the things that I kind of, it hit me in the head very quickly, because I, I think I'm very sensitive to this, is in the, the, do, the short documentary about your life, it said that your father was not at home. That's right. And I think a lot predators are very smart they're not stupid people and i think they know they very very quickly know who is a who to groom they know who who is a possibility and who is not right. and i think more and there's been studies done that children that don't have a father at home are more likely to be sexually abused yeah so yesterday i just did a uh, i did a, a netflix interview for a documentary it was the same subject too really? and so yeah in my case um scout masters that's who i was abused by first um the scout masters would go out to the poor neighborhoods which i lived in and they would look for single moms wow and then they would ingratiate themselves to the mom and they would say hey he's going to be in the boy scouts we'll take care of him so then, yeah, you're right. They know who to groom. And there's sort of like a radar going on. I can look at a pedophile and I, I, I can go to mugshots.com. I don't look at their profiles, but the pictures, just seeing their face, around the eyes, around the lips, right here. I go, you're a pedophile. I click on the, the profile, arrested for child abuse. The, the accuracy is stunning. And the sad thing about that is that the pedophiles also have that ability to identify a child who's been raped or is it vulnerable? Wow. Yeah, my, I mean, my dad was, God rest his soul, my dad was always at home, but we had a difficult relationship and I had uh, 
because I don't know because of that or as a consequence of that, I had a a bad relationship or a problematic relationship with boys at school. So I was your I was your very typical lonely boy, lost lonely boy, and boy is that is that a is that a red flag for uh, predators? Well, I had a different experience because I ran the school. I ran the neighborhood. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. Um, but um, repeat the first part of the question, please. Well, I, I mean, I was talking about, I guess I was talking about a, a sort of profile that a predator, especially in a young boy, mm -hmm. will recognize, you know, your dad wasn't at home. I had a difficult relationship with my dad. And then you were saying more about that you weren't really that odd kid or the kid that was left out. You were, you were different. You would come from a different place. Yeah. You know, my, my dad was a real bastard. Uh, when I was four years old, he made me drink an entire beer on New Year's Eve. And then him and his drunk buddies would throw firecrackers and M80s at me. A drunk kid in the street. About six months later, um, my dad um, was caring on my mom really bad. And as a four-year-old, I tried to step in and break it up. And instead of just pushing me aside, he took me by the shoulder and just flung me against the wall. And I broke my shoulder and my arm. And uh, he brought me to the hospital. He was totally drunk. He brought me to the hospital and said that I fell out of a tree. Uh, and back then they would believe that today it's a totally different story. Um, and my dad was, a was, a, a Navy chief and he always made me call him chief. I couldn't call him dad. Oh, and when he found out about my abuse, he argued with my mom and no, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. Uh, you weren't present. Uh, you didn't watch the kid enough. And, uh, he said, and I'll be frank. Uh, sorry for the language. He said, I'm going to kill those motherfuckers. And just like dad did, he went to the corner bar and got drunk. And he told everybody in the bar that he was raising a faggot. Oh, great. Great. And so they ran him out of town. Uh, and after that, I've only seen him two times. No. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, this is a tough question for me to ask but I think it's, it's, it was definitely in my case. Do you think your childhood made you susceptible to abuse? Not that you were necessarily looking for a father figure, but you were s susceptible to grooming from a man who looked benevolent and who looked kind. Yeah, so trust is a very valuable yep. in our world. And so I had a mix growing up. Um, so I had pedophiles after me. But there was also some men that I could trust. And uh, there it's extraordinary events. Uh, I, was, uh, I was confronted by these good men. So I had plenty of mentors too in my life. Well, that was it. I, that's something I did not have. And thank God that you did. You did have that. Um, one of the other things that men who are survivors experience is anxiety. Mm -hmm. And fear, a fear, PTSD. People, I think, are sometimes confused, and I was confused about PTSD. I'm like, I can't have PTSD because you're kind of we're kind of the same generation. It was like Vietnam vets had PTSD. You know, they were shell shocked, and I was like, well, I've never been in war. I I can't have that. But I was I was my molest molestations are kind of strange. I was molested in confining spaces. I was molested. In a, in a public bathroom and then in a parked car. So mm -hmm. since that time, I've always had a fear of, I've been claustrophobic and I couldn't figure it out I, to panic. That was all PTSD. It was, and I, I'll tell you the way that the brain works. So um, survivors, they live in their amygdala. And so that part of the brain is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And so when you live a life, like that and survivors do even into their advanced ages um they have a heightened sense of of uh, they're very vigilant vigilant um they are, um so anyway when when you let court so when you're in that condition you release cortisol yep 
cortisol is great, uh, but it's supposed to be in and out of your body, just like that. And when you live a, a life in your amygdala, cortisol is constantly dripping, dripping in your body. It uh, compromises the immune system. Yep. Uh, and that's why victims and survivors, you know, have physical ailments later on in their life. Um, and it's, it's just tragic. And, and yeah, what you experienced was PTSD. And Richard, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. The way that that uh, presents itself um, is, you know, uh, the way it presents itself is acting out, risky behaviors, things like that. And it constantly keeps you in a cycle of, you know, of, of living in the amygdala. And what's worse is children, they have these horrific traumatic experiences at a very young age and their frontal cortices haven't developed fully yet. And so these neural pathways between the frontal cortices and, uh, and the amygdala have been well used. They're embedded in your brain. And it's really, really hard to get past that. That's what you said. I keep saying it, I, I, I sound ridiculous. What you said is very important because I, I've, I've been living with that most of my life. Mm -hmm. I have been living so tense because mm -hmm. I always feel like I'm going to be attacked. I know it sounds bizarre, but I, I don't relax. It's very difficult for me. Um, people need to realize that the survivors of child, I'm going to get really upset, the survivors of childhood sexual assault, some of them never recover. They don't. None of them do. Yeah, so that's that's the thing. You can look in the DSM-5 manual, which is uh, a manual for all mental disorders, and it does a really, really good job of explaining every malady that a person can have psychologically. However, in the manual, there are no cures. There, are, In our present mental health profession environment, there are no cures for any mental disorder. The only thing that you can try to do is manage it successfully. What we have, we will die with. There is no cure. Yeah, and it, it depends on all the, everybody's brain is different. It depends on how the abuse fragments the brain and how things are cartmental, cart, cart, cartmental. compartmentalized, thank you. I mean, I, integration, I think, is, is possible to a degree of healing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, I, there's a really awful movie from my childhood. Um, it was a Clint Eastwood movie, um, Sudden Impact. I don't know if you remember it. Um, sure, I watched it, but I don't remember. Oh, it's horrible. Sorry. It's, I, I don't know why it was such a big hit. It's a horrible, horrible story. What, but there's an important part of it. It's about a, a sex abuse victim, too two sisters who were gang raped. Um, Sandra Locke is one of them. She was a great actress, God rest her soul. Um, and she, she becomes like a vigilante. She gets revenge on these people. And her sister is so shattered that she's mute yes. in, in, in a mental home. So people don't, I think people don't realize the gravity of, of the trauma when this happens to you as a child, I don't think they don't get it unless, unless you've been through it. Right. Well, when all the victims and survivors almost unanimously, they want justice. They don't want a paycheck. That's the one thing that they crave is justice. And you can throw fifty thousand dollars at it, hundred k, five hundred k, and my and my. What's it gonna do? What is that gonna do? Nothing. Mental people, and another thing people don't realize is mental health is not covered by insurance. That's why there's so many people. I live in San Francisco. That's mm. why there's, and I'm not all homeless people are mentally ill, but a large number of them are. They're untreated. Absolutely. And I'm kind of lucky in that regard because the Boy Scouts of America pay for my psychiatric wow. and psychological treatment for the rest of my life. That's awesome. But, but you're right. Um, when you go to a, a, a psychologist, no, we don't accept insurance, but if you have insurance, we'll give you a receipt and then you can claim it. Good but luck. You, they, yeah. And Good luck. 
they're being lazy on paperwork. They could do that just like any medical office. And other people are indigent. Um, they don't have insurance. And so they have to go to state agencies to receive any type of medical health care. And my wife is a psychiatric nurse. And she took yesterday in a Netflix interview, uh, she said about 80 to 90% of all of her trauma patients have had childhood sex abuse. You know, people think that the sex abuse scandal bankrupted or possibly bankrupted the institutional Catholic Church. If that, if the institutional Catholic Church had to pay for all the silent survivors out there who have never come forward, had to pay for all of their uh, pharmaceuticals and their um, th their psychi psychiatric bills, it would be completely bankrupted forever. Well, yeah. So in the Catholic Church and the Wallings, um, they they uh, filed bankruptcy, and yeah. it was it was a litigation tactic. That's all it was. They had a very short deadline to file for victims and survivors. Very short. I talked to some victims and survivors. I said, why didn't you find on time? And it's, it's like, it's, I can't write it down because it's so horrific. And by moving all of these 50 plus cases to bankruptcy court, all of those depositions and documents got sealed. The archbishop no longer has to testify and they will settle with these victims for pennies on the dollar. It's a way for, and other dioceses have done the same thing. It's not a way to protect uh, victims. It's a way to protect the assets of the church. That's Absolutely. They... Yeah, so the Catholic Church is a, it's an institution and it's an organized crime ring, right? basically what it is. They've been raping for children for almost two millennia. And the problem with the church is that the pedophilia is, um, it's institutionalized, it's systematic, and it's the wholesale rape of our children. That's it. Everybody knows that now. And so the, the church is so corrupt that the mafia in Italy actually learned their trade craft from the church. And, and the church gets excused from all these things. So for example, if I was a, uh, I was a finance guy in New York City, the FBI would come in and toss my office. They would take the computers, the files, everything. If I was a drug dealer um, and they served a search warrant on my house, do you think that they would allow me to go uh, on the porch and give them a list of drugs I used to have? No, but why does the Catholic Church get this, this special treatment? They have, a, they have a lot. In certain sectors, they have a lot of power and a lot of influence and a lot of, politi a lot of political power. Yeah, everybody in New Orleans goes through the Catholic school system. And, and, it, and it's good education, but you know, this produces politicians, community leaders, things like that. So uh, New Orleans, uh, sorry, Louisiana in general is like over 90% Catholic. Um, and so they become judges and attorneys too. And so it's, it's kind of hard uh, to get your case heard and have representation. Yeah, there's people don't realize that a lot of, and, I, and I'm not saying this because the Jesuits were part of my abuse story, mm -hmm. but you just have to look at some of the connections between very powerful government leaders. There's mm -hmm. always a Jesuit connection either between a Jesuit university or a very prominent Jesuit chaplain. Um, the Jesuits are very, very good sorry, at guys. infiltrating society. Um, and I think it's a damn shame because they could use those talents other, where, uh, other places. Um, but uh, one of my, couple of my heroes is Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis Xavier, and they founded the Jesuit order. And I think that they're rolling over in their graves right now. How far that order has fallen, and there's a reason why the Jesuits were suppressed at one time. Um, every time I go down one of these rat holes where mother emails me about her young son whose history I don't know, and I don't ask about, 
who gets involved with some sort of priest who is grooming him, telling him he's gay or something, or ushering him into some sort of um, LGBT Catholic activist group. I, when I go down those rat holes, it's always a Jesuit. It's always a Jesuit. They have a very, very invested interest in that. I, I want to get your reaction to something because it's something that horrified me. And if I had to, if I had to pinpoint an actual minute and second where I said I'm absolutely done with the institutional Catholic Church, I'm done with the Roman Catholicism. Now you're you're a you're a you're a Southern guy, and now you're in Texas. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress that's held in Los Angeles. That where the John Jay report was done. I'm not I'm not sure the connection there, but I, I don't know. But it is, I mean, real quick, Richard, um, it's the largest gathering of Roman Catholics in the United States. Um, it, I don't know about COVID. It's been kind of, I don't know what they're doing. But I mean, every year it's held in Anaheim at the Anaheim Convention Center. And I've gone. Mm. Um, most DREs, C, uh, CCG teachers, um, Catholic parochial school teachers, priests, sisters, nuns, are go you know are, are really kind of required to go especially here on the west coast mm -hmm. and um it's a catechetical conference supposedly and um i've gone because they have lgbtq sessions and um i've been interested in what's being taught there uh because it's a big deal because it's just it's kind of a bad word to use it's disseminated um out into the parishes from what goes on at this place every year and i and i went and one year i was absolutely horrified they had a priest catholic priest get up and this is what he described he described children that he thought could possibly be lgbtq as young as seven and eight years old okay identifying already as lgbtq uh, okay, okay. And then he talked about how to identify those children as, you know, alienated from their peers, as being, you know, lonely, as being depressed, you know, whatever. Uh, and then they, they, he, they recommended to educators that they befriend that child, that they gain that child's trust. And then he recommended that they confirm an LGBTQ identity with that child. And I thought, I, I don't know what the intention is. Maybe these people have good intentions. I don't know. But I said, this is a blueprint for a predator. And yeah. this is what the Catholic Church is teaching. A Catholic priest is standing up there telling people to have these conversations with children uh -huh. about, about sexuality. I said, this is insane. And yeah. Archbishop Gomez, Archbishop Gomez is the prelate there. He's in charge of the USCCB. So this is going on all under his auspices. Um, uh, Bishop, Bishop Barron, Robert Barron is there. He's sort of the Catholic, the face of Catholic Catholicism there. This mm -hmm. is all going on. I said, they're giving classes on grooming. Yes, they are. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, well, that's part of it being s systematic, you know? Um, they have a culture in the church and it's very secret. And um, they, the parents, those lay people, um, they see it going on. It's the biggest open secret in the world. Um, and, you know, the, the lay people, the ones that, that look the other way, the ones that enable it, um, that are part and complicit of these crimes, we hold them in the same pathetic esteem as the uh, church hierarchy. The same thing is that culture of secrecy. Can you talk about enablers, Richard? Because I think you're a hundred percent, a hundred and ten percent correct. Yeah. So enablers are um, attorneys that know that a crime is committed, but they don't say anything. It could be a, a Catholic teacher, which was in my case, as a Catholic teacher walked in and and saw my abuse, and he didn't do anything about it. Um, so they are complicit. They are complicit. I never reported my abuse, but every priest, when I talked to them later, every priest 
knew the problematic priest, everyone. And, I, and I'm not holding them to account. I, I can't do that. God's got to do that. But they all knew. Yeah, they did. And I bet that's, I bet that's true in your case, too. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, they knew. And, and, even, and even lay people a lot of times knew, oh, that was Father so-and-so. Oh, yeah, I'm not really surprised. But, but also the, the other lay people role is that never happened. That oh. didn't happen in my church. You're a liar. I don't believe you. I, I don't think this can be underestimated is the propensity in the Catholic mindset to have a bishop priest groupies. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> who will defend a priest. It's, I mean, so many survivors can come forward and they will continue. I've seen it. I've seen it online, which yeah. is such a toxic environment 90% of the time. I've seen it and say, oh, that priest is being set up. That priest is set the conspiracy series and roll out. Uh-huh. Yeah, so um, we are taught to do that. So an example of the Knights of Columbus I'm a fourth degree, but when I was going through my third degree, super secret ceremony and secret handshakes, all of that stuff. And we're taught in the third degree exemplification that we defend priests at any cost, at any cost. And it's like a little skit that's going on and everybody, one person's beating up on a priest and everybody comes to the rescue. And it's, yeah, and, and so maybe at, in the third degree in Isaac Columbus, maybe the ones you defend as a first priority is the children, not the priest. This, oh God, I, the, the, dear Lord, okay. Um, this goes up the chain from priest. I see it with, with, it was one of the reasons I had to leave the church. I see it with Francis when, and this is, again, I'm naive, I think. When that very first, and I've got issues with Vigano, I think he's become a, a conspiracy theorist. I, I think he's sullied his brand. God bless him. Mm -hmm. But when he came out with that first letter saying that Pope Francis knew about McCarrick, that McCarrick was a serial pedophile. He did. I, I thought there's no way he can remain pontiff. I'm so naive. I thought he's going to have to resign. And I thought, finally, at that point, I was maybe going to stay in the church or come back. Finally, I think that we, things would clean up. People have defended him tooth and nail. Yeah. And every auxiliary bishop, bishop and archbishop knew about it and covered it up. They are complicit in these crimes. That can't be stated. I just, I think a lot of Catholics and I think a lot of so-called good conservative, whatever traditional Catholics have moved on as well. I, me as a survivor? No, I haven't moved on. Are you kidding? No, no, I, I can't. I can't. I can't feel, I mean, I'm never, that's part of my problem with, with therapy too. I'm never going to feel comfortable and you don't feel comfortable in this life. You're never going to be a hundred percent safe and secure. It's just not the way life is. And I think that's the way I want to feel. But I, in the Catholic church, I don't even feel that there's an acknowledgement. There's no acknowledgement. There's no taking responsibility. No, when I went for, um, I went directly to the Jesuits and I went to them for spiritual guidance and counseling. Uh, and they said, no, here's a whole bunch of money. Shut the fuck up. <gasps> well, they didn't say it like that. I'm paraphrasing, right? Yeah, but that was a sentiment, yeah. Yeah, and so they made me sign a confidentiality agreement. To oh boy! Talk about it, and this is years after um, after their conference in Dallas, which prohibited them from asking for uh, a uh, confidentiality. Are th those are called NDAs, aren't they? Non disclosure agreements. Non disclosure agreement, confidentiality agreement. Yeah, that was one of the, because uh, I don't want to get into specifics because then Catholics start hating on me, but I don't really care. Um, that was one of the issues I had with Colonel Pell down in Australia, um, is the, the, non, the NDAs um, mm -hmm. that survivors were forced to sign. If they These are people that, like we just talked about, that probably need mental health. Some of them can never be functioning members of society again. 
And sure. I could see why they signed an NDA. But they they sign against they sign their rights away. It's, it's and it's it again. Well, no, they, it, don't, it, they don't sign away. It's not enforceable because the NDA uh, was covering up the commission of a crime. Oh God! So but, next- but but Richard, you have to admit that these people are traumatized and vulnerable, and they feel like they have to shut up. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, yeah. That's their emotion. That's their feeling. But whenever they get up the courage to go public, they're not ever going to be sued because the NDA covers up the commission of a crime. It's not enforceable. Mm. But- and, and here's the other thing: when I went public, if they do sue me, well, they're suing a victim, and I'll be a poster boy for that that story too. How's that sound? You're God bless you. You're a warrior, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of people. And, and I see it in my friends who have also committed suicide. They can't do it again. They can't do it again. They just, they can't. They can't come up against, like I talked about that wall again. It's, it's too much. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could do it, but I, 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 the people that I just couldn't, they couldn't do it. You know, how many times are they going to have to come forward and tell their story yet again? I know. It's tough. I know. It's a nightmare, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I want to talk about this. I'm looking at my time. I want to talk about uh, um, re-victimization because it's one of the things that drew me to your story again yeah. is because I had been victimized as a child and then I was victimized as a teenager and then I could say I was re-victimized as an adult. Yeah. Um, this is the prevalence of sexual revictimization. This is a study from 2017. Mm-hmm. The prevalence of sexual revictimization in terms of those who have experienced CSA, childhood sexual assault, 47.9. It's almost 48%. That's sad. Almost half of those who are sexually assaulted as children will be revictimized. Yeah, and, and it's not just um, the act of re, uh, re-victimization, but, you know, every time a news story comes on about child sex, you're triggered. So that's re-victimization. Um, and we never, I never thought I'd see this in a million years, but um, the cover-up in the Catholic Church is starting to eclipse the actual acts of abuse. And yep. And when you, uh, when you're a survivor and you go forward, or or just you know sue the church, you have to retell your story in great detail. You're re-victimized again. One of the other problems I had with the Pell case too is that victims in Australia referred to um, to get help within the Catholic Church, psychological nope. help. Never okay. do. Oh, Thank you. To church. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering what you felt. Well, a police report and get an attorney. They're, they're not in a position to protect you because they were ones who molested you in the first case. And we've seen this several times now when they go to the church and they give their statement later on when they get an attorney and go to trial that their own words were used against them when they went to the church and told their story in complete confidence, uh, trying to trust them. They re-victimize them again by using their own words against them. Yep. Part something in your story reminded me of the McCarrick report, which I read, which I read. Um, this is the one from the Vatican. It's 400 odd pages. This always stuck out with me. This is page 73. This was a priest victim. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry, whoever's listening. I believe he was assaulted by. McCarrick as an adult, as a seminarian. Um, but he's reported it in the Catholic Church. And um, of course, the Catholic Church tried to keep it in-house. Sure. So this is this is from the McCarrick report. Monsignor Gambino arranged for priest number four, who's the survivor, to meet with Father Edward Zogby, SJ, a counselor who was affiliated with Fordham University, a Jesuit university. After the counseling, which also involved taking priest four's confession, Father Zogby wanted to give priest four a hug and then tried to kiss him and grabbed his crotch. So this, 
th this, this happened to me as well. So here we have a survivor going to the church, mm -hmm. seeking help, and they're re-victimized again. And that happened to you. It's absolutely horrible. And I think people don't realize that it actually happens. Oh, it does happen. And they got wind that I was going to go public. And they, they sent people out to visit my family uh, to try to discredit me. We traumatized again, right? And their behavior behind the scenes is much different than the public face they put on. They don't give a shit about survivors. They only care that they would go away. Exactly. One of, some of the other... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm watching my time. Some of the other issues, this is specifically that men have in terms of surviving sexual assault as a child is communication issues. That can be with partners, their spouse, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Drug or alcohol use or abuse, of course, that's a big one. And that's what, what is called, and I think you mentioned this too, it's self-medicating. It's self, it's self -medicating. These people haven't been helped in any terms of way of therapy or pharmaceuticals. So in order to ease the pain, they ease the pain. And, yeah. and, and, you, and I think I read in your story that, that you got involved in alcohol abuse too. Yeah, um, so I, I never really, the drugs never stuck with me. Um, but uh, I didn't drink a drop of alcohol until I was 47 years old when I started addressing my abuse. And that's when my drinking got really, really bad. Wow. And it was, was it just because, a stupid question, was it just because the memories were just too painful and horrific to, to, to deal with? No, it's because I was angry and full of rage. It was anger. Okay. You see, for me, it was the terror. It was the terror. I, I don't think at that point, I didn't become angry until later when I tried to address these issues within the church. And then I got angry. But early, it was just the, the, the terror, the terror. It's terrifying, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nobody wants the humil humiliation of going public. No, nobody wants to be branded. Uh, it's so taboo. Um, yeah, it's a horrifying thing uh, to live with that and to go public because you're going to have to deal with telling your story one more time. And we, we feel like we're not going to be believed, you know. And so it's, it's a rough time. So. And, and, and male survivors don't don't come forward. I think one of the things that that was really good about the Me Too movement was that it it became more, I don't know what the word is, not acceptable, but it became, um, what's the word, Richard? I think it was, it's never easy for a survivor to come forward, but I think it, it gave people the strength or the courage sure to come forward because so many other people like Rose McGowan, who I really admire, um, but there hasn't really been that moment for men. No, well, you know, men are raised to be uh, masculine, straight men anyway. Um, <laughs> nothing bothers you, you know, you just suck it up buttercup and get on with it, you know, uh, put a bandaid on your ass and get, get on in your life, you know? And, 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 and because the, no. the masculinity uh, uh, part of it, um, it's even more taboo and, and none of the other men can know about it, right? Right. Yeah. And it's- As a it's, man, a straight man, do you really want to admit to anybody that you were sodomized by a man? But dear Lord, I, I was going to say it's even worse when the abuse and- it's, it's quite rare, it's not unheard of, but it's rare for, it's rarer for a woman to sexually abuse a, a boy or a man. It's, it's more common for a man to sexually abuse a, a boy. So it's, there's a def, there's a stigma attached uh, to that. To you know, I was saying taboo, I meant to say stigma, I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 it means the same thing. I mean, that was part of the reason why I, cause you talked about shame. That was part of the reason why I felt so uncomfortable as a kid, because you're not sure about a lot of things. And I wasn't sure about my homosexuality or my sexuality. 
And then if it's like, if people knew that I had been sexually assaulted by another man, well, that man, that just kind of, that just would confirm it. And, yeah. um, yeah. The, and that's why I, I, I had that promiscuous uh, period because I had to prove to myself that I wasn't okay. Right, right. The other, the other um, two um, situations that male survivors will find themselves, we've kind of talked about this, sexual identity confusion and hypersexuality, which is a way of, of, of dealing or I guess it's a way of, I guess we should say of not dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because I felt like when I heard your story, it, it, it's, it's, it's horrifying, but I don't know if it's just your personal demeanor or just your personality, but I, I got a lot of hope from it because I think it's maybe the, and you've talked about this, that you've, you, I just talked about it right in the beginning, that you didn't really have a problem with, with discussing, you know, your story because you've experienced a lot of healing. Yeah. I mean, I know that's a lot to talk about. Could, could you talk about that with, because there's a lot of male survivors out there who don't know what to do. Uh -huh. um, wh where is a good place for them to start? I mean, what, what does the process lo look like? to be to be in the space that you're in so i was a little bit of a different personality growing up i was i was very assertive i'm, I'm really smart i got my phd and everything and wow. um, i kind of ran things <laughs> and uh there was a time in, in my life uh, where i wasn't the best kid in the world and uh so the, the first thing to do is join an organization like ours. Uh, in our organization, you can attend uh, weekly support meetings um, and you can be anonymous. You don't have to turn on your camera. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to share. And just um, get used to the community that we have of survivors. And that gives you strength and that gives you confidence. We see miracles in our meetings all the time. If you don't go to the weekly support meetings, we'll do one-on-one -on -one fellowship with you. So you need to have support. That, that's what, that's what encourages you to go to the doctor and tell them what's going on. To go to your counselor and be totally honest because you know, you're rebuilding trust and confidence. Something that's really important about what you're doing, and I, and I can't, emphasize it enough. I, I haven't participated in your group, but I'm, I'm going to. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm still in a triggering phase, so I'm a little bit, I'm wary, I'm wary. Because um, I might hear somebody's story that, that might really trigger me. But what's really important about what you're doing, Richard, is you have separate, I don't know how you call it, spaces or discussion groups for men and women. I think that's really important. Could, could you talk about that, why that's important? Yeah, so I used to be a, a leader with SNAP, which is an organization just like ours, and uh, started doing support meetings. And what I observed is that when men and women are in the same room, they don't share as much as they should. Now, I, and I designed, I designed the organization like that, that we weren't going to be co-ed, only in terms of the support groups. And, and it's been a success. Uh, we've had people come into support groups uh, and shared for the very first time. Wow. We, we've had people come into the support group just bawling and crying, and a week later, they're living their best life. So the fellowship aspect is very important, and I feel it's best done, um, you know, not in a co-ed environment, because that never happened uh, prior to me starting the organization. I, I never experienced that type of success. Okay. Do does someone have to be a pre-sex abusive survivor, or can they just be any? As any? long as long as you're a victim of childhood sex abuse, we don't discriminate. We're all inclusive. It's not just about the church and the Boy Scouts. You know, the biggest demographic uh, of children that are abused is in the family setting. Yeah. Uh, you know, the drunk uncle, the babysitter. You know. 
So we, we don't discriminate at all. You just have to be a victim of childhood sex abuse and you're welcome. And our services are free. Part of the thing about, do you guys talk about mental health at all? Be, I'm ah. sure you do. Because ah. I, I think there's such a stigma, especially for men, about seeking me professional mental health help. Yeah, we make those referrals and also- um, You do, wow. Yeah, yeah and, and also we teach, we teach everybody grounding techniques. We teach them how to box breathe. Or we make those referrals, yeah. We have an intake specialist for members. Uh, they reach out and they're licensed and credentialed and, and they try to figure out what's going on and what the best course of action is for them. And, and just because you're seeking mental health, professionals if you're seeing a psychiatrist it doesn't mean you're crazy oh, it doesn't no, it doesn't no I, I a lot of people believe that unfortunately and and pharmaceuticals for certain people are really scary they, they don't are. want yeah but that's and, and they're yeah i'm sorry and they're not for everybody no no they're not you know that's why you need to be guided by a psychiatrist to see what works and what doesn't and you, your primary physician can give you the same drugs but they're not psychiatrists they don't really understand what you're going through yeah so i think and i think that the medication can be mismanaged at the level of of the php but not at the psychiatry, psychiatry level right right i i agree i agree and I don't want to end our discussion on the issue of suicide because it seems like such a downer. But like you, I've had people that are close to me commit suicide. I've, I've, happened, I've had it happen in the last couple of years and, and they were survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And these were not people who hadn't addressed their abuse. They had, they had tried but again, like I said, the, depending upon the brain and the fracturing, it's so severe, th they had tried. That's why there's no shame in asking for help. No, three quarters of America goes to a, a psychologist for all kinds of reasons. There's no shame in getting mental help. No, now, no. I wouldn't tell everybody in the world that I go to a psychologist. Well, I do because I do interviews, but... <laughs> Yeah, you know that that's an aspect. It's covered by HIPAA. You, your story and what you talk about, and in the psychiatrist's office with medications, all that's protected by law. Right, right. The this the scary thing about seeking psychiatric help is that when I did, it's it's difficult because I had um, I had doctors that would not address my mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Right. It's, it's very odd. There's a certain, and I, I, I know you got to go, there's a certain agenda in some spaces where we don't address that. Absolutely. We don't address it. That's not your problem. They don't, they don't even look at it. I mean, yeah. with me, because of, I, they just thought it was all conflicting with my identity, uh -huh. but I was like, I had been sexually abused and they didn't ask me. Yeah, and here's the other thing, you know, about that level of care, you know, your psychologist or your therapist needs to be trauma informed. That's very important. Right, right. Because right. If, you, if you go to a regular therapist and all it teaches dialectical and cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapy, that's not going to work. You need one that's trauma informed and trained. Right, right. Oh, there's. That's there's what Baby, come here. They want to see you, my beautiful wife. Eh, not so pretty today. Oh, pretty. you are. God bless you. <laughs> I'll let you go, Richard. And I, I want to. I I think I think your organization is very important because I think you've done a lot of the difficult work already. I think people can seek help from your organization, and I think they can guide people. Um, in a way, because I mean, when I was looking for help, something, well, the internet wasn't around, but um, something like that. So I was all trial and error. I had to just go to the phone book and try to uh, find therapists. No, this, they're not right. They're not right. 
And, you know, and it was, it was a lot of work because like you said, you got to retell your story, but organizations like yours are so important because I think you've done a lot of that difficult work already for people. Well, yeah, we do. We're very, very high touch for our victims and survivors, very high touch. And you're not going to get that in a lot of the organizations that have the same mission. They're just donation machines. Exactly. Because all the other um, organizations, they don't have weekly support meetings. Um, they don't have one-on-one -on -one fellowship. Uh, we actually call somebody when we haven't heard from them in a while and we're worried about them. Wow. God bless yeah. you. That's and awesome. We, and we do advocacy work. You know, we got the statute of limitations for child abuse completely eliminated in the state of Louisiana. We expose pedophiles. We, I, we do a lot of intelligence against the church. I, I've been doing relationship mapping for years. I have sources that come to me and tell me what's going on. So we do a lot of work. We're I very, very busy. I bet you do. And again, I want to remind everybody that I'm putting more information about Richard and his organization in the uh, video description for this video. Thank you so much, Richard. God bless you. You'll be in my prayers. And please, please keep me in yours. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having me. It's, you know, awareness is one of our biggest initiatives. So the more we can do any type of a media, someone comes forward and gets the help that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. God, God bless you, Richard. God bless you too. And thanks for having me. I look forward to doing it again.